You're listening to a Roddenberry podcast. Nine out of ten doctors agree. We'll be right back. No one can escape the long arm of the law on Genealogy, a Roddenberry podcast. Episode 9 Reformed Criminal. Welcome to Mission Log Genealogy. I'm Norman Lau. And I'm Earl Green. Every week on Genealogy, we bring one of Gene Roddenberry's early TV scripts in to question it and put out an all-points bulletin to find its morals, meanings, and messages. Because even though Gene was famous for working those into his later work, he was already slipping those messages into his earlier work as well. This week, we start covering Gene's work on another 1950s police drama, Highway Patrol, and examine the first of five scripts he wrote for that show, Reformed Criminal. Earl will be back with trivia in a moment, but first, here's how you can reach us. Genealogy is meant to be entertaining and informative, but it's also the beginning of an ongoing conversation about the works of Gene Roddenberry. Drop us a line at missionlog at roddenberry.com and join us on X, formerly known as Twitter, and Facebook at Mission Log Pod. While you're at it, leave us a review and a rating at Apple Podcasts or your favorite podcast platform. And please remember your comments could be used on future installments of Genealogy. And now here's Earl Green with this week's trivia. Thank you, Norman. Toward the end of 1955, Gene had been a TV writer with produced scripts for a little over a year and a half. Using the pseudonym Robert Wesley, he had been both the technical advisor on the syndicated series Mr. District Attorney and one of its writers since 1954. By day, Gene was still working in the public information department of the Los Angeles Police Department. Having already proven to Ziv television programs that he was a capable and reliable screenwriter, Gene was now getting in on the ground floor of a new series that would let him continue to write what he knew, police work. For the record, Gene's official biography states that this was not the first story he pitched to Highway Patrol, but merely the first one that sold. Whatever the previous story pitches might have been, they don't appear to be in the archive, or they may have been earlier, less developed versions of the scripts he did eventually sell to the show. In the end credits of this episode, the name of Highway Patrol's audio supervisor might stand out, a very young Quinn Martin. And yes, it is that Quinn Martin. He started out as an audio and sound supervisor on numerous Ziv series, including Sea Hunt, Harbor Command, and Science Fiction Theater. I Led Three Lives, West Point, The Cisco Kid, and at least 50 episodes of Highway Patrol. Quinn's days as a celebrity producer were just a few years away, starting with Jane Wyman Presents Fireside Theater. He would go on to produce the Westinghouse Desilu Playhouse Anthology series, The Untouchables, Craft Mystery Theater, and a few TV movies before hitting his heyday in the mid-1960s, producing 12 O'Clock High, The Fugitive, The Invaders, Dan August, The FBI, Banyan, Cannon, Streets of San Francisco, and Barnaby Jones. Talk about burying the lead, here you have Quinn Martin and Gene Roddenberry working on the same show early in both of their careers and in very different capacities. Highway Patrol starred Broderick Crawford, a veteran character actor who had been propelled into mainstream stardom with his starring role as Willie Stark in 1949's All the King's Men. Crawford arrived in Hollywood in the late 30s after having starred as Lenny in the Broadway adaptation of John Steinbeck's Of Mice and Men. Since Hollywood was operating under the studio player system at the time, Crawford signed up with Paramount initially before he became a contract player for Universal in the 1940s. At the time the Highway Patrol came about, Crawford had earned a reputation for being a bit difficult to deal with, thanks in no small part to his ongoing battle with alcoholism. It's even been said that on most days that he was filming Highway Patrol, any scenes with dialogue had to be in the can by lunchtime because Crawford was known for sneaking off to indulge in a little bit of a liquid lunch. And being hired by Ziv to star in Highway Patrol was something of a career renaissance for Crawford. He left Highway Patrol in 1959 to move to Europe and to try to quit drinking to no avail. When he returned to the States in the early 1960s, he started another Ziv series, King of Diamonds, that lasted only a single season. After that, it was back to the TV guest-starring circuit. 
Crawford's familiarity from Highway Patrol was still a selling point for him, though. He appeared as himself in Chips, with Punch fanboying out over him, and spoofed his most famous TV role in an early episode of Saturday Night Live. We lost Broderick Crawford in 1986. How much was he carrying? A little over 31000 all negotiable. Frank Wood, age 33, just promoted to assistant manager. He's been with the Farmers Cooperative about five years. These were the co-op branch deposits? Right. They were picked up once a week and brought to the main office in Grantwood. Last seen? Marshville. He left there at 10.20 a.m. en route Grantwood on State 14. About three hours overdue. Dan Matthews of the California Highway Patrol takes on cases where criminals may be on the move or on the run and brings them back to face justice. This is just one of his cases on the Highway Patrol. Act 1. The California Highway Patrol puts out an APB on a missing person, Frank Wood. He was last seen picking up the morning deposits from the Farmers Co-op in Grantwood, California. And now he and the money, all 31,000 bucks of it, are missing. But when a fingerprint match reveals that Frank Wood is actually Frank Bacali, a criminal who dropped off the radar seven years ago, that APB becomes a felony warrant. The manager at the co-op says that Frank has been living in town, well, about seven years now that you mention it. He's a hard worker who just got promoted. This was the first time Frank was entrusted to handle this kind of money. Now that Frank's boss knows the full story, he's not happy. Once a thief, always a thief, he says. He wants Frank convicted. But Detective Dan Matthews, taking charge of the case, says that's not how the police or the courts work. They'll try to find him, bring him in. The rest is up to a jury of Frank Wood's peers. Or Frank Bacali's peers. But Frank, whatever name he's going by, hasn't actually done anything wrong, yet. He's been in an accident. His car ran off the road, rolled down a ravine, leaving Frank and the bank bag with the co-op's deposits in it spilling out of the driver's side window. Frank is a little worse for wear. He comes to, gathers the bank bag and its contents, and starts walking down the road. He tries to flag down, well, anyone who could give him a ride. No dice. He walks until he reaches a gas station and asks to use the phone. Just as he's about to turn down the attendance radio so he can hear the operator, he hears a news bulletin about himself. He's a wanted man again. The gas station attendant picks up a metal pipe to try to knock Frank out. That doesn't go so well because Frank knocks it out of his hand. The attendant assumes he's about to be violently robbed. After all, Frank does look kind of rough at the moment. But instead, Frank panics and runs, bank bag in hand. The gas station attendant gets on the phone to the authorities. Hey, that guy you were looking for? He was here. Frank's footprints show that he used a large dried-out drainage culvert to hide and then escape. The highway patrol converges on Hawk Canyon near Grantwood. Detective Dan Matthews pays a visit to the hotel where Frank has been staying. The pastor of Frank's church is there, and he shows Matthews around Frank's place. Bowling trophies, photos of Frank taking part in the local barbershop quartet, Do these look like a guy who is looking forward to being back on the run from the law? The pastor suggests that Matthews pay a visit to Frank's friends, the Browns. It's right about then that Frank pays a visit to his friend, a farmer named Ed Hutchins. Ed's already heard the news over the radio, but he doesn't have a problem letting Frank come in and rest. Put your feet up. I'll get you a cold glass of water. But when Ed returns, he doesn't have a glass of water in his hands. He's got his shotgun. Ed tells Frank to stay put while he calls the highway patrol. Ed's pretty sure there's going to be a reward for being the one to turn Frank in. Act 2. While Hutchins has one hand on the telephone and only one hand on the gun, Frank takes a chance on throwing a punch. A shot is fired. Matthews and another patrolman race to Ed Hutchins' place, finding him unconscious on the floor. Frank is gone. The bank bag is gone. And so is Ed's shotgun. This really isn't looking good for Frank, because now he's armed and dangerous. The Reverend, who is still riding along in Matthew's car, stays at Ed's place to make sure he's okay. Frank is spotted by a highway patrolman as he dashes across a county road. 
One urgent call across the police radio later, a trap is set. The highway patrol's last chance to corner Frank before he gets across the Nevada state line. At Ed Hutchins' place, the reverend is curious about what exactly was said. Ed Hutchins is still bitter about the fact that the man he regarded as a friend was living a double life this whole time, and it's only later that he finally opens up about what Frank actually said, that he had been in a car wreck and was trying to return the money rather than steal it. The Reverend uses Ed's phone to call the highway patrol with this new nugget of information. There may still be a chance to resolve things peacefully, but even when the Reverend shows up at the roadblock near the state line, he can't convince Dan Matthews that this isn't daylight robbery. The only man who could convince Matthews of that is Frank himself. And there Frank is, shotgun and bag of money in hand. You know, to every law enforcement officer on the scene, this sure looks like daylight robbery. But then Frank does something unexpected. He throws down the gun and he turns and walks back the way he came, toward Grantwood. He's going to face the music rather than running. Matthews pauses and watches, and then holsters his own weapon. Frank walks all the way back into Grantwood, into the farmer's co-op, and he apologizes profusely for being late, handing the bank bag to his boss, who just seems to be relieved to see Frank is okay. Dan Matthews and the Reverend are there, too. Frank offers to throw himself on the mercy of the court for any of his old charges, but Matthews says we'll let the judge decide that one. Frank wonders who he has to thank for the fact that he's not going to jail, and Matthew suggests that that's a question for the Reverend. The End Fantastic recap, Earl, and here we are off the heels of last episode's recap and review of The Secret Weapon of 117, thinking, okay, we're going back to a Gene Roddenberry police procedural, and it's going to be a fairly easy, quick and dirty, very easy to break down type of episode. I was pretty much wrong on that one. (laughs) Yeah, I think we have learned our lesson from, you know, the end of Police Academy is dude got taken down. Who did he get taken down by? The son of the officer he gunned down at the beginning of the episode because, of course, it's poetic justice. And we have only 24, 25 minutes in which to do it. This is a bit more complex, and I feel like maybe because we are dealing with something that is not established like Mr. District Attorney was. Just keep in mind, by the time the TV series that Gene wrote for came to be, there had been a previous TV series. There had been movies. There had been a whole radio series. You couldn't really change up Mr. DA. Whereas here we're on something like Episode 9 of Highway Patrol. We're still deciding what this show is. We're still deciding who Matthews is as the main character, there's a bit more wiggle room. There's a lot less familiarity, and so there is room for more nuance and complexity. Now, we are dealing with a show that can be seen. Highway Patrol was released on DVD quite a few years back in season sets, and, you know, fairly large season sets, because this was back in the day when TV shows were expected to crank out you know, upward of 26 episodes, you know, into the 30s. But now those DVDs are, for the most part, out of print. So Norm and I are able to compare the scripts to the final product, and there are some fascinating differences. We have Gene's final master script, dated August 23rd, 1955, but we also have the episode, which aired November 28th, 1955, quite a while after Gene's last episode of Mr. District Attorney. You know, my first impression from watching this, and especially the opening credits, here's my first of very big questions, because I always have that big question. Was Highway Patrol, quote-unquote, the original series of Chips? Or, let's put this another way, was Chips, which is basically the 1980s series, you know, starring Eric Estrada, you know, that stood for California Highway Patrol, was that basically Highway Patrol the next generation? Because aside from the eras that they were created in, these were essentially, quote-unquote, California Highway Patrol-based police procedural dramas. But then again, this is Gene, so it's not like he's going to create, like, say, Highway Patrol in Cleveland, you know, or in Miami. 
And there's also the disclaimer, as there are in Ziv Productions, of thank you for the generous cooperative efforts of the et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, Highway Patrol, just like Mr. District Attorney. So it just felt like, okay, I can watch TOS Highway Patrol, and then 20 years later, I can watch Chips, (laughs) or 30 years later. I I think I may have a better analogy for you. Okay. I think Chips is the TOS of Chips, but Highway Patrol is the forbidden planet of chips. Oh, I like that much better. California is a big state, and there are gigantic cities with all the crime and vice you could ask for to make a story out of. There are little towns like Grantwood, because Grantwood really appears to be kind of a backwater by modern California standards in this episode. I don't even know if Grantwood is actually a real place. I should have looked that up. So you have a vast difference in population and kind of the feel of a locale. You have rural and agricultural areas. You have mountains. You go far enough north, you have historically active volcanoes. (laughs) You find everything in California. So I think it's kind of a no-brainer here that they are leaning into, yes, this show happens in California. We are not trying to make it any town USA anymore. It's getting past the point where we can pull that off. The APB at the beginning of the episode that's out for Frank, you know, last scene at 1020 AM, there's already an APB out for him. This is kind of funny because this makes, you know, once again, we are dealing with kind of a time capsule show and there are vast differences in the way things were done then versus now. And nowadays, if someone is missing, unless it's, you know, an an urgent thing like an Amber Alert, they have to be missing for a certain amount of time before law enforcement makes it their problem. And here you have a guy who's late with a five-figure deposit, and we are mobilizing everything and everyone within five hours. It's not meant to be funny, but in retrospect, it kind of is. Yeah, it's one of those kind of things where you gloss over kind of like the reality of the situation so you can plunge like right into like feet first into the plot so that you know that there's a man on the run, he has money, the cops are looking for him, and that's the first 30 seconds. Now go. Now you have like the rest, like the 26, 27 minutes left to tell the rest of the story. Yeah, you you just have to jump into it. And it's it's just one of those things that really kind of marks out how much time has passed since the show was made. I do like the Reverend rattling off the names of families who Frank counted as friends when he's trying to tell Matthews, you know, this is who you need to talk to to vouch for Frank's character. This list of families that Frank has befriended includes the Bradberries. Now, this is not an incredibly obscure surname, But I really did find myself wondering if perhaps Gene was giving Ray Bradbury a shout out here. Well, we know that Gene isn't one to like throw around names lightly. So sure, I was half expecting to have a Riker in there somewhere or a Klingon in there somewhere. You know, something that he used like previously. But yeah, I kind of had the same idea that uh, the Ray Bradbury was who he was basically giving a nod to. But um, that led me down the road to yet another Let's play the home name game, you know, for Mission Log Genealogy. And some of the names, like Frank Wood or Frank uh, Bacali, not so much, you know, not so much with uh, Matthews either. But Martin Rock, I thought, was a very interesting name. And this is the pastor's name, uh, the friend of, of Frank Woods, who seems to be the only one behind him as a, as a friend and as someone who believes in, in Frank. Martin... Uh, the name Martin has its roots in Latin, and it is derived from the name Martinus, which was the name of a popular 4th century saint, St. Martin of Tours, who was a bishop in France and who was known for his acts of charity and kindness and is one of the most widely venerated saints in the Catholic Church. Now, rock means rest, and because of the name Rocco, which comes from the Germanic root word rock, which means rest, the saint who used this nickname helped the sick find rest. So it's possible that Gene named Martin Rock this particular character name in such a manner that maybe some audiences of the 1950s would recognize the name as one who was, quote unquote, charitable, kind, and helped the sick or weary find rest, 
which in a sense was what this character did uh, for Frank and perhaps maybe even the conscious for for Matthews. What do you think? Well, we're kind of in the same time period where Gene was uh, working on Secret Weapon of 117. And so I'm not going to deny the possibility that the names he is choosing are... He, he's getting into more careful choices of names than his old war buddies. So there may be something to it. Now, in the script later on in Act 2, we have some more omitted scenes, specifically scenes 83 and 84. No idea what was originally there, but something evidently either didn't help the flow of the story, or it was recognized as something that they just couldn't achieve on location with the time and budget available, because it really almost this entire thing, aside from maybe the police office, the farmer's co-op, maybe Ed Hutchins' house... Those are the only things I really remember is thinking, okay, these are sets. Everything else, they're out and about. Yeah, uh, I read this interesting like article. It may have been on, pretty sure it was on Wikipedia when I was looking at the name for Martin Rock, You know, going down the rabbit hole of Ziv Productions. And there was something along the lines of Ziv, Frederick Ziv, priding himself and his production company on making the most inexpensive productions of the time, not necessarily low quality, but inexpensive. And I think that when I was watching this and, and having the luxury of finally now being able to watch the episode alongside with reading the script and the script breakdowns, there are so many interesting transitional scenes where they're using stretches of time focusing on a police car going one way, then a, a short period of dialogue and then another police car going another way and then, you know, having all of these B-roll type footage uh, scenarios where you're trying to pad or stretch the timing of the script wherever the director feels like there needs to be more or less pacing. So there's obvious stock footage going on here. And I'm sure that if we watched every single episode, we'll see the same stretch of highway to and fro, you know, according to the episode. So I'm wondering, Earl, because you know this history so well, is this just something that they used uh, because uh, much like a, a certain very beloved director in Star Trek, where the economy and the speed of the filming was so precise and tight, tight, for those of you who like tigers, that you needed to be able to pad certain instances so that you would get your X amount of minutes plus advertising to make that tight 30 minute cut? That's possible. And, you know, also consider the fact that whatever time and film that they spent on getting that stock footage, okay, that costs something. So you've got to balance that out in the budget somehow. So we are going to use the heck out of that stock footage. Yeah, I look forward to seeing if there are more instances of Matthew's going this way, Matthew's going that way, <laughs> right. you know, a little voiceover in the middle, because... That is that much less film they've got to run through a camera. Because you're right, Ziv prided himself on a 30-hour work schedule for a single episode of TV. Only 30 hours. And sometimes that meant five, six-hour days. But Ziv preferred to get it over and done with in three 10-hour days. Some of the things I do like looking at, though, in this time period, going to Ed Hutchins' house, he invites in Frank Wood, knows he's Frank uh, Bacali, uh, almost kind of like makes him sit down and puts him at ease. And then I know maybe because I've just seen it too many times, you know that it was telegraphing a, let me go get my gun yeah. so I can hold it on you and call the police. But it's so awkward because not only is it like the worst possible like weapon to basically hold in your hand, which is a basically it's, it's a, a shotgun, you know, is a you know side by side, you know, uh, shotgun that he needs to hold in one hand. This is Ed Hutchins. And then he has to reach backwards and not only use the phone, but crank the phone. Yeah. And then use the phone. And I'm like, you know, Frank would at any one point in time, if he was actually kind of the career criminal that they think he is, could have overpowered him. But we had to suspend that disbelief because of what the, the nature of the scene was trying to convey. It's as much tension as they could afford to build in 1955. 
it was ratcheting for sure. <laughs> um, here's an interesting thing. Now I know that not all of our uh, audience can see this though, but on script page 27, scene 71, Gene has actually provided a diagram of how all the police patrol cars are covering the highway grid where Frank would have been spotted crossing certain intersections. Now I know that we're dealing with a certain era and a certain level of complexity that may or may not reach, you know, the final production. But the one thing that I wasn't sold on in, in the final cut of this was how the police cars, which were illustrated to go to and fro all over this area were actually cutting off certain sections of the interstate or the highway to the point where they would say like, Hey, look, there's a guy running across the street. It reminds me of that, uh, that uh, traffic sign, like right in front of San Onofre in Southern California, where you see like the family, uh, the warning sign of families crossing the intersection. I'm wondering if like, is it that obvious when somebody just one man is running across a highway, you know, surrounded by uh, half a dozen police cars? It just seemed to be a little loose, a little convoluted. I wonder if this was Gene showing his work, not as the writer, but as the technical advisor. Because, you mm -hmm. know, Robert Wesley is still the technical advisor for law enforcement matters on this show. It may not always benefit the final product to have done that, but he's shown his homework. Hey, I technical advised on this. When I was describing the, the safety diamond, the yellow diamond with the family, quote unquote, crossing the interstate highway, it's actually supposed to be one person. It's just that over time, some people have drawn illustrations of an entire family crossing the highway, which is, it's, it's a thing. It's a California thing. It, but did you notice all of the wind wings that were open on all the police cars in this episode? Yes, I did. And, you know, hopefully... Some of these people graduated from the police academy, and they remember that incident and know not to leave loaded weapons in the passenger seat. Okay, Norman, in an era when these shows could often be boiled down to the cops reel in the bad guys and protect the public for the log line, the middle of this episode hits the brakes to discuss compassionate policing with an additional tangent on compassionate sentencing with regard to what Frank has done right since he apparently brought his life of larceny to an end of his own accord. Now, Matthew seems unmoved by the Reverend's plea for some kind of clemency. And at the end of the episode, when Frank is making a beeline for the border with shotgun in hand, well, as they say in modern political discourse, the optics are not in Frank's favor. The fact that he's been going by an assumed name also doesn't look great, and the script really plays with this idea, and it, it runs the risk of making our man Matthews, who's supposed to be the hero of the show, seem intolerant of any moral failing on Frank's part, or anything he perceives as a moral failing. The border scene at the end is actually kind of tense for TV from this era, because if Frank keeps making a run for the border fully armed, and I do not mean he is going to pick up Chalupas, Matthew is going mm. to stop him at best and probably drop him if he raises that gun. You know, I was uh, a little concerned uh, in the first act, you know, knowing that we were coming off of the secret defense of or the secret weapon of, excuse me, 117 into this episode, because I didn't know if we were going to fall into a little bit more of kind of the Mr. District Attorney theme or tone. And that's very, that's how I felt with the first, I would say maybe, you know, 10 to 12 minutes of this episode before we met the Reverend uh, Martin Rock and uh, his take on Frank's background and obviously his current situation. So, the way I saw Matthews in this, going back to you know your your original point, I didn't see him as intolerant as opposed to a little bit more indifferent, and certainly in a way that maybe the Mister Mister District Attorney or Paul Garrett was. But Matthews did lean a little bit more into guilty before proven innocent, and maybe that's because we needed to see the reconciliation of Matthews' original. Um, understanding of this character. He is already in the system. 
he can't leave the system. All we do is kind of perpetuate the system. And that's why I can't make any sense out of my job. So I thought that was probably a little bit more purposeful than say the Mr. District Attorney, the way that they crafted and positioned Paul Garrett, where he's like, I'm just here to report the facts, ma'am. And to, you know, expedite the, the procedure, you know, of bringing criminal to justice as opposed to where I think Matthew seems a little bit more war weary about fighting crime on the streets. And I think that that blends into his character really well. But I do love that you brought up that particular scene at the end, because I really enjoyed as obvious as it was with a man literally standing at a crossroads of two signs saying salvation is this way, quote unquote, and damnation is this way, quote unquote, and him wrestling with the actor wrestling with what this character of Frank is supposed to do and how Matthews is off in the distance waiting for that summary judgment with pistol in hand. I thought that was brilliant, if not obvious, but it was really well done. I like that shot. Compared to how obvious a lot of Mr. District Attorney seemed a lot of the time, the visual may be obvious, but it is also effective. I was impressed by the fact that the script feeds the audience a lot more information than it is giving to Matthews. That really ups the stakes because we know that Frank is toting around a shotgun because he just had that same gun pointed in his face by Ed Hutchins, and he took steps to defend himself. We know that's why Frank has the gun. Matthews doesn't know that. For all Matthews knows, this man is now armed and dangerous and, you know, wrested this weapon away from someone else in a life-or-death struggle. And Hutchins not putting all the information on the table really doesn't help Frank in that regard. We know that Frank's trying to get the money to its intended destination rather than skating out of town with it. Matthews doesn't know that, and he doesn't have any reason. You know, as you pointed out, you know, he has dealt with a lot of cases. He's kind of seen it all. He's a bit jaded. There's no reason for Matthews to imagine that Frank is going to return the money until the very end when he ditches the gun and heads back home. This is a nice way in terms of structuring the script to up the stakes because everything seems to be headed for some kind of exchange of fire at the end, and then they diffuse the tension. That was not entirely predictable, and I really appreciated it. What did you think? Yeah, you know, this is where I think that, um, again, going back to what I said before about my concern with this episode is I didn't really feel that at the start, and we did say this in Observations, that it was a little glossed over as to why Frank was on the run. We get to that information a little bit later on when, you know, he's talking to, when Matthews is talking to uh, the Reverend and the Reverend saying, did you know that seven years ago, this is when Frank came upon the scene. He has done such a commendable job in trying to turn his life around. And then Matthews has a counterpoint to that saying that, well, that may all be well and good, but this is the kind of person that I'm used to dealing with. You know, they put on a really good act, but they're going to eventually like fall back on their old patterns I wish we got more of that. Like we didn't really, at least for me and maybe different for you and maybe different to the people out there who have actually seen this, but because everything in the first, say five minutes of this episode was so strangely paced, at least for me, I didn't really understand why Frank was on the run. I didn't really get that. Like there was no real instance of him flipping the car. Now, maybe this could have been a production issue, but all of a sudden, you know, he's on the run. There's, you know, there's uh, Matthews at the police station, you know, with the, the, the lady on the teletype, you know, pushing out the information to all the police cars and the APB. And then, you know, police cars going this way, police cars going this way, you know, back and forth. And all of a sudden, Frank is at the bottom of a ditch, you know, with money strewn around in the, in the grass. And there's no real reason why. I mean, there's no like, oh, he, you know, he swerved to miss a deer or something, or his tire blew out, you know, all of a sudden he's just there. So you're facilitating all these very interesting points to put Frank into the situation where not only does he look guilty outwardly, but because he's so banged up and beat up by the time he gets to the, uh, the garage, you could just tell that anyone who would have encountered Frank at that time would have been suspicious, right? So it's not that 
it was apparent. It was a little misconstrued, I think. And I, by the time we get to the Reverend, everything kind of like falls into line as to, oh, oh, okay. I can see like where this misunderstanding is happening, where this preconceived notion of Matthews to a criminal, but to the Reverend is more forgiving, et cetera, et cetera. So that, that to me, again, it's better in the second act than I think established in the first act. Yeah. And this is another case where it almost feels like, and I believe we made this observation or I made this observation with police brutality. There was more story than there was show. Mm -hmm. The show was not yep. com The show did not allow for the kind of complexity that was really required for that story. And so it seemed watered down and very cut and dried, very, very pat ending on that. Here we have a more complex story it's not so complex that there is not time to tell it, but some odd pacing choices, as you pointed out, were made at the editing stage. We've got stock footage theater going on in the first 10 minutes. I understand that you can't really show Frank's car having the accident because that's going to be a big stunt. Right. You know, and there's like, you know, the shorthands of... Frank looking off in the distance, the camera zooms in on his piece of the windshield, his eyes get really wide, and you hear a screech and cut goes to one of the egregiously long segments of a police car going to and from wherever its destination. So I'm not saying that it's uh, it's not a big sticking point. It's just that because we are now probably expecting a little bit more out of a, of a Gene Roddenberry script and production, and we know where this slates, so we know that this is kind of like within the the timeline of him starting to emerge with a little bit more credibility and skill that once we start watching these, because we have a certain threshold of quality that it may be a little bit, we may be a little bit more discerning or a little bit more critical when it comes to the tightness of his storytelling. And we know that's not all on him. We know that there are many hands that, that touch a production, you know, editors, you know, et cetera, producers, Frederick Ziv himself, that may have called the shots in the final production. Now, there is kind of a shocking turn midway through the show with Ed Hutchins. He is even less forgiving than Matthews, and he is ready to turn his old friend, well, seven years or so, he's ready to turn this guy over for a big reward, and he is sticking a loaded shotgun in his friend's face so he doesn't go anywhere. Now, first off, this is some definition of the word friend that I'm not sure I wish to become acquainted with. But what we really have here is a side character whose outrage may be somewhat legitimate, given that he has also, kind of like Matthew's, been fed very limited information and assumes that Frank is up to no good. And as we pointed out, it's easy to make that assumption. But what Hutchins does with that information, that is not good. The fact that he takes a long time to get around to telling the Reverend what really went down. Uh, boy, I mean, if you're looking for someone who's on extremely questionable moral ground in this episode, you may think it's Frank. I think it's Hutchins. You know, that's a great point. And this is, again, in, in Act 2, this is like where I basically sat up and paid a little bit more attention to kind of like the moral complexity that was going on. I was waiting for that snap your fingers, aha moment. And this was it. And there's obviously a, um, you know, a, a similar theme to, or a, a Judas equivalency here to the 30 pieces of silver, you know, with Hutchins. And I also think that it starts leaning a little bit more into this almost inescapable past that Frank has, because once this information starts coming out on the radio that he's not Frank Wood, he's Frank Bacali, and you know he has a he is a career criminal of years past, and the people that believed in who he was and the goodness that he did is all summarily erased just because that does you know it leans more towards seeing what Gene is has established like in yes a little bit of the mishap of balance, you know, in the first act and in terms of the storytelling, but how it unfolds really well in the second half of, or the second act of the story, because once the Reverend is there really kind of like putting the, the moral question to Hutchins and like this, this man was your friend. No, this man helped you 
without charging you to rebuild your roof. This man was a friend to the community. You went bowling with him. You did the, the quartet with him. All of these things. Why in the last seven years did that not actually mean anything to you? Like what happened? So you learn about this now. Does that erase the seven years of friendship and goodwill, you know, in closeness and brotherhood that you've established just because you heard it on the radio, just because you don't have the truest understanding of who this man really is, or do you not believe that it can actually change? So I love that that's, that's where we're leaning to, um, you know, towards the end of this story. And then you have the, as we said before, you have that moment of truth standing at the crossroads and kind of choosing which destiny that you're going to follow. I thought that was absolutely brilliant. Everything in the second act for me really works. Overall, this is fairly nuanced compared to what we were running into with Mr. District Attorney. Because your police dramas of this period, they did not concern themselves with the inner thoughts or inner struggles of law enforcement. You really didn't get into that sort of thing until the 70s or 80s. But in this period, in the 50s, the typical police drama tended to add some guardrails on your portrayal of law enforcement. And working within those guardrails, I thought that what Gene accomplished with this half-hour show even if there was kind of an imbalance in how well the first act set things up for the second act, it was fairly impressive. I mean, it was a very tight story, like overall, you know, and uh, I like that there's a, there's a tonal distinction between what we have seen with Gene style as he set himself up as a new writer with Mr. District Attorney, because there, and we have said this before in, in our coverage of that series, that Paul Garrett really is... He's benign in, in terms of how he affects the story. He is the facilitator of serving justice. But I felt that Dan Matthews in this, because he has a little bit more, what's the right word? I think he, he felt just a little bit more towards a, his opinion of, of Frank Wood, Frank Bacali, where he already had a, a preconceived judgment about his situation when he first met Martin Rock, where the... The reverend had to step in and say, let's take a step back for a second and look at who this man was and who this man is. And I think that that's very different than, say, the Mr. District Attorney approach, you know, to to criminals, especially, say, in police brutality, you know, where one of the officers was being accused of a crime that may or may not have happened. I didn't really feel that Paul Garrett was actively pursuing clearing that the name of that officer the way that, say, Matthews was already kind of like making up his mind about Macaulay. But that really now falls into how important Martin Rock's character was in this. And that's a kind of character that was missing from, say, a Mr. District Attorney episode, kind of like the moral character that doesn't necessarily preach about it, but he does make you look at it from a different perspective and the way that he handled Ed Hutchins and say, Question why you are acting this way. Question why you are thinking this way. And I thought that was very important. All right, Norman, we're in this part of the show where we bring the episode that we have watched or read the script to, or both in this case, bring it in for some questioning and see if we can find out what its morals, meanings, and messages are. And I don't know about you, but I have a lot of thoughts for this little half hour of black and white television from 1955. Now, we know about Gene's police career in broad strokes, and we know that he kind of rode that into his television writing career. Smart guy. What we don't have a lot of is specific granular information, what inspired some of his stories, especially in this particular genre that was so close to his day job. There's a strong element of compassion, avoiding prejudice, and most importantly, a philosophy of de-escalation on display here, something which, as far as cop shows go, really mark this out as a specimen from another time and place. Modern action dramas almost always work on the opposite principle, which is maximum escalation. 
build things up to be so bad, build the bad guys up to be so evil that any and all courses of action, even things that would be completely unacceptable in peacetime, are now open to the characters who are the nominal good guys. Modern sensibilities seem to dictate that you keep upping the stakes, working toward that last reel, that last act, and then all the violence and stunt work and pyro that you want is now available to you for the exciting climax. But not here. The stakes are high enough, and at the critical moment, choices are made on both sides to de-escalate the conflict. We don't see that enough now, in my opinion. And there probably wasn't that much de-escalation in 1955, either, because I'm thinking now of how many District Attorney episodes we reviewed that built up to some kind of standoff or exchange of gunfire. This is different. This episode of Highway Patrol feels like Gene is working through something, maybe something he was exposed to on the job. And in the form of this script and this show, he's putting that in front of the audience to ponder as well. Just because the stakes are only one man's future doesn't make the moral message at the heart of the show any less vital. You can put the gun down. You can lower your fists. You can lower your voice. You can opt not to fight. You can opt not to raise the stakes. You can opt to ask questions first and either shoot later or preferably don't shoot at all. Yeah, I love the way you phrased that, Earl, because I think that you and I, during the course of reviewing this and then kind of like comparing it to the script and trying to find that 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 kernel, that Roddenberry moment that sets off like the rest of kind of like the, the tone and the pace of the episode, I think that maybe it may have landed for us around the same time. But I think that you and I are also both fans of uh, when our stories have a little bit more of a moral gray complexity to them as opposed to white hat, black hat, because sure, that's a, a certain tone, you know, in this era of television, that's obviously very easy to, you know, to get behind. Like in, in Mr. District Attorney, you know, you have the embodiment of justice and you have crime. We're trying to find that moment, you know, when Gene's starting to shift kind of like his sensibilities in his writing. And I think that between this and Secret Weapon of 117, you're really kind of seeing that quality start to to work its way into the script. Now, I can't go back on what I said earlier in observations and discussion where I felt like there's a little uneven tone uh, to the the pacing and the production of this episode. But once it actually hits the mark, once you can actually see that Roddenberry moment peek through, then you're really invested, or at least I was, you're really invested into, okay, here's where the writing actually begins. Here's where you're starting to get challenged about this morally gray area. And for me, it started off in one scene and it ended in another scene where I felt Gene really pushing the moral message of this. When Matthews, when he chases down some information and he finds out where Frank Wood or Frank uh, Bacali is staying, you know, he runs into the, the Reverend Martin Rock and they have a conversation. And Matthews says to him towards the end of this conversation, I've known hundreds like him talking about Frank. Maybe it's not their fault when they start broken homes, foolish parents. There's always a reason they start stealing penny candy. Then they graduate something bigger. Every time we try everything to stop it sooner or later, we have to put them in jail. They serve their time. Then we put them in jail again. Maybe it's a merry-go-round. Maybe jail's not the way, but it's all we've got. And the Reverend says, you don't believe Frank got off that merry-go-round. And Matthews replies, with his background, do you? That's closer towards end of Act 1, beginning of Act 2. But at the very end, this sets up and begs the moral question of this story. Does one's past always cast a longer shadow over one's present or perhaps over one's future? Can one atone for one's sins with a lifetime of devotion to doing good works like Frank did? Making friends, being part of a community, spending the prior seven years after he committed that crime to doing better? Or will that always be suspect from the past, from their past crimes? Can, as they were talking about, one get off the merry-go-round, as the Reverend and Matthews discussed at the end of this episode, when the Reverend looks at Matthews escorting Frank to his custody hearing, and when he says, one passenger off the merry-go-round, and then Matthews kind of relents from his earlier position. He says, 
even one is important. And the Reverend says, we have the same motto in my work. From that moment, from the very beginning of the episode to, now, to the end of the episode, you really do see a little bit of a shift in, math, in Matthew's tone. And I like that. I like that it's not just a, just the facts, ma'am, or we're here to do justice, or here's the sentencing, you know, let everything figure it out, itself out, you know, after we bring it to the court of law. I like that there's a stake here. I like that there is something in Matthews that may have shifted because, as you said so brilliantly, Earl, as long as you take the time to pause and think, as long as you take the time to look at what's happening and say, Maybe confrontation isn't the best option. Maybe understanding is a better option and see where it goes from there. Mission Log Genealogy is produced by Roddenberry Entertainment. Special thanks to the Roddenberry Repertory Players. Our cast this week featured Mark Proct as Detective Dan Matthews and Scott Martin as Mr. Morse. If you would like to support us directly, you can do so at patreon.com slash missionlog for early access to shows and the Mission Log Discord. If you have any material that might be of interest to us that isn't already in the Roddenberry archive, drop us a line at missionlog at roddenberry.com. Our website is missionlogpodcast.com. On the next Genealogy, Human Bomb. Special thanks to consulting producers Matt Esposito, Homer Frizzell, Tom Kozak, Julie Miller, Mike Richards, Mike Shabel, Paul Shadwell, and David Takechi. We'll be back next week with more of your favorite programs. This concludes our broadcast day. This is a Roddenberry podcast. For more great podcasts, visit podcast.roddenberry.com.